I don't know where you are in life right now or where it is you want to go. But if you are a curious soul like me, I know this about you. You are searching for greatness in life. You desire financial freedom. And you ask yourself daily how you can master success in business without wasting years of your life. On this show, we're going to interview all the leading experts and influencers in the fields of marketing, mindset, and sales to expose all the tips and tricks you need to accelerate your business and amplify your success. My name is Reem Kharbat, and this is the Entrepreneur Accelerator. Hello and welcome back everyone to a new episode of the Entrepreneur Accelerator. This is your host, Reem Kharbat. And um, in today's episode, I'm super excited because uh, my guest, Marty Park, he has owned and operated over 13 companies in six industries since he was 21 years old. His first company was a technology startup, after which he ventured into audio production, retail, the hospitality industry, and most recently, advertising marketing. He has been a crucial player in all phases of startup and growth, including corporate strategy, sales, marketing, operations, and finances. Marty was awarded the Business Coach of the Year for North America and the recipient for global contribution to the coaching profession. Marty has also been selected as one of Calgary's top 40 under 40. Marty was awarded the CYBF Canadian Mentor of the Year and selected as one of 18 entrepreneurs to represent Canada at the G20 Entrepreneur Summit in France, Mexico City, and Russia. Marty is a high-performance entrepreneur coach, best-selling author, and keynote speaker. Welcome, Marty. Thank you so much for being here in the Entrepreneur Accelerator. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thank you. Um, I know that this episode is going to be really, really interesting. Um, But first, for our audience, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your background? Where are you coming from? Sure. So my background was, uh, I think, like lots of young people, I was following my dad's directive of you were going to go to university, get a good middle management job at a big corporate uh, international conglomerate like Procter & Gamble would work my way up the corporate ladder and eventually would get a good pension and retire. And in university, in college, I uh, met up with the Entrepreneurs Club, started, I've got the entrepreneur bug, this idea of starting a company sounded so interesting and challenging and fun. Uh, So I told my parents that I was dropping out of college to be able to start a software company, but not to worry because I would be retired in six months. (laughs) And of course, six months later, I was not retired. I had maxed my credit cards. I, we, we had barely sold anything. We were building uh, telephony software systems, so like uh, mm-hmm. the same technology of, as voicemail. And uh, we really start. we were just playing business, and then we really had to start doing business when we said to my business partner, Greg's dad, would you put a mortgage on the house so we can keep the business going? And soon as we did that, things became really real. And mm-hmm. uh, But it, it'll actually, the best thing in the world, because that pressure of knowing that there was mm-hmm. a house on the line uh, really forced us to learn business fast. And so at a really young age, I had learned an awful lot of pitfalls that I think most of us as entrepreneurs go through. That's and from there, awesome. I've, yeah. And from there, I've, I have jumped in and out of different businesses, a lot of them based on, ooh, that sounds fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I've gotten older with each business, I'm a little more selective and a little bit smarter and ask better questions. But a lot of my Uh, experience has been based on just things that speak to my heart or things that seem interesting. And uh, yeah, it's been a really, I've made more mistakes than with a lot of the, all the being in so many different businesses than most people. And so that's my big mandate. I think the same as you is to help other people where they have taken that courageous, risky step to start a business, to just help them do it better and uh, really enjoy the ride of entrepreneurship. Love it. And don't you think that this is like seriously the most liberating thing in the world? Maybe you have not tried to be an employee before. I have tried that. And I know how it feels, you know, when you're stuck into something that 
you just said it. You said you you had lived almost to what what they call the American dream, which is you have to get better, you know, uh, grades and then good job and then you know uh, go to college, graduate, get the higher uh, good degrees and like this is where I come from and this is what I realized that ninety nine percent of people they they were conditioned to believe that this is the way to live your life uh, to freedom because with a secure income secure job and um, uh, this is what I believed as well until I realized that I lived someone else's dream I built someone else's idea and and I was so good at it um, Marty how is it how was it uh, uh, for a 21 year old kid you know f for that age uh, kids they want to party they want to have fun they want to um, you know, do things and just enjoy their life. How was it for you? Like, was it because of your dad um, that you are already used to the concept of being around or surrounded by entrepreneurs or business people? Like, how did you uh, become that kid, that cool kid for me? That's interesting. The so my dad actually became an entrepreneur years after I started a company. Now I think he's always oh. been very entrepreneurial, but one day he had said, well, we're going to, I'm leaving my job and I'm going to start a company. And my sister also had uh, taken that approach. And my, I feel like me becoming an entrepreneur was also uh, encouraged them to do that, to go out on their own. But at 21, I mean, I, I had so much energy. And really, because I think I had, I think what most entrepreneurs have, I was uh, blissfully ignorant. I had no idea what I was really getting into. Yeah. And so the idea, but I was that guy who went and got up at seven in the morning and was at the office early and worked all day and into the night. And then I'd still go out for beers with my friends and mm -hmm. live the 20 something life. I just, even if I went to bed at three in the morning, I was back up at mm -hmm. 6.30 or seven o'clock and back to the office. And I'd work six days a week and I loved it. And mm -hmm. so I was like when business owners or entrepreneurs, I say, do it early because there wasn't a lot yeah. of risk. I had all the energy and time in the world. Now having kids and a family um, and running different companies, I realized, wow, time is my biggest limitation right now. And I, so I appreciate how much I used to have. But I did everything. I tried to be a 21-year-old college guy still partying. and also be the guy who pretty quickly had a dozen on a dozen employees and payroll to worry about. Um, so looking back, it was a lot, but at the time it just seemed like a lot of fun. I love that. I, I wish I, I wish I was like you. My problem is that I was that a student and I, my mom and dad, they were like uh, uh, teachers and I had to think in a certain way. I had to live in a, in a certain way. And I wish that I had the freedom um, to like, you know, have the liberty to think and follow just what I, I always wanted to be a, a painter, by the way, which is something that maybe no one knows. Um, did you get the support from your family by taking the decision to drop off college and just start something like, did they call you insane or crazy for doing that? Oh, yes. As good parents, and this, like you, I was a very good student. Uh, so when I said I'm leaving college, I only had one year of my English degree and my uh, business degree left. So I had one year to finish with two degrees. And when I said, I'm, I'm leaving school, but I'm starting a software company, they, like most parents, said, where did we go wrong? You were such a good kid up until now. <laughs> this is crazy. And I said, but, you know, I had that confidence of somebody 21. Don't worry, mom and dad. It's going to be fine. You watch. Oh, I'll be retired goodness. in six months. Wow. Um, now, it, there was a number of years went by, and eventually my dad said, you know, I realize now that was a good decision for you. And that was, that was really felt great to have him say that. Um, but I didn't, I was all enthusiasm. Both my business partner, mm. Greg, and I were just, you know, we're just going to go uh, conquer the world, and away you go. Now, I think with every business, as I got into my late 20s and then into my 30s and now into my 40s, um, I'm less uh, blissfully ignorant and more aware of the challenges. Mm -hmm. But also then I make a better plan. Uh, if I take a business now, I, before I get into it, I have a pretty good idea of what we're going to do, where we can go with it, who we could sell it to. Back then I was just diving in. 
that was my only action step. Let's yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, love it. Did you have a coach during that period? Let's say throughout the your um, growth. Um, did you have a coach? Did someone help you? How did you figure it out? Like seriously, sometimes you have a, a full degree and yet you make the same mistakes and you have the same fear and imposter syndrome and, and you don't know how to do a real business plan. Like you can read how to do a, a business plan or get an MBA in that. But on ground, when you have to do it for your own business, you don't know what the hell you're doing. So how, how did you do it? You're absolutely right. That Sometimes academically knowing it and then being in your business and having to execute it are two different things. So, yeah. um, I mentioned before that we got a mortgage on Greg's dad's house. And that was the turning point because Greg's dad suddenly said, and this is way before coaching as an industry had really mm. uh, grown, grown up or sprouted up. But Greg's dad said, all right, listen, I'm going to come see what you, you kids or you, I forget, he had some name for us, I'm sure, you two guys are doing on the weekend. So Saturday mornings, we're going to start to sit down and I'm going to ask you about what you're doing. And then my dad started showing up at those meetings. And then a couple of times they brought friends of theirs. And so it became like a board of advisors very Mm. quickly. And they started giving us ideas and things to do. And now looking back, they were very much like a team of coaches, giving Mm. us direction, ideas, helping us see what we couldn't see. And so I, that was really was the turning point for our business was that accountability and the, the insight that they could give. And I'm a big believer that even if you buy a business, you have fresh eyes on that business for about six months. Everything is new and you can really see things. True. But after about six months, you know, it's like going to the same restaurant every day. You walk in and you stop looking at the walls and it's just, or like your house, you know, you, you don't see the details anymore. Um, so I love that, yeah, you have that six month window, but then to get perspective again, you have to have an outside person. So for a lot of years, I didn't have a coach. I have had my coach, Steve, out of Australia. Um, he and I have been together for the last seven years, maybe eight now. And he has been instrumental for me helping turn around a business, just helping me keep that perspective on things. He laughs because he often says, you know, you know, this stuff. And I say, look, I know it in other people's business. I can spot it so clear I know, but in I my know. own. I really am the person standing in the forest right in front of the tree and I can't see anything. I, and so I think one of the biggest things with coaching is that getting perspective for somebody who's not in it so they can just help you see other ways to solve problems or other ways to deal with your team or just all the things that come up. Mm -hmm. What do you think was the number one or the thing that truly accelerated your success? whether it's in your life or in business, like the theme of the show is the entrepreneur accelerator. And um, I talk about um, the, let's say the strategies, the mistakes to avoid the strategies that you can pick now and implement that would make like a real difference uh, in your business. What do you think was the thing that helped you or you felt that there was really a big difference in my life and business once you changed or once you adopted Yeah, I think there's three things that were major learnings for me. And every time I got one of these learnings, it quickly improved the business I was in and made the next one I get into, get into or got into that much more effective. And the first thing was, um, and I have a, I, I, this actually comes from my book. I have a chapter and it's called sell, sell, sell. And mm-hmm. what I mean by that is even today I wake up, I come to work and every day I think, who can I sell something to? And I don't mean sell in a negative way. So many people have a negative connotation. I really mean help. So it could be, if you don't like the word sell, instead of sell, 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 think of it as help, help, help. But I'm always wow. thinking about where can I make a transaction? Where can I get a customer? And I'm thinking about the thing that drives all business. It's not inventory or finance or administration. Until something is sold, nothing happens in your business. True. So I've found... That first lesson for me was if we are selling something and making efforts to move people uh, closer to transacting with us, that has always made the business accelerate. And so many people get, as soon as they do start to have some customers and staff and everything, they they get away from that sales focus. And so I I believe that that's the first thing is that keep that sales focus every single day. The second Mm -hmm. lesson I got was um, 
that business is people. I understood that. I mean, everybody knows that without people, there isn't necessarily a business. But when I really started to understand that culture, relationships, learning about how people are wired and about how they're motivated um, and focusing a lot on giving to my team and then the relationship and the people really knowing them as customers, that was a huge accelerator because it kept my team. We didn't have to worry about high turnover of people. Um, yeah. It made for a more enjoyable experience. The loyalty of customers, all that came from it. And then I think the third thing I learned was uh, know your numbers. And I see this even mm. today. I'm talking to very successful entrepreneurs. You know, you ask about how much money's in the bank or their receivables or any number. And if they give the, well, I think it's about, I would say, I think it's about is not actually a number. So yes. I found that the controls aspect or just the money control and knowing really the heartbeat of your business, where things are at, uh, is sort of that third piece of, so some people say, know your numbers like the money side, but it can also be the, the KPIs or the metrics of the business. But those three areas, every time I've mastered selling or sell, 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 uh, the business is people and remind myself of that or that piece of knowing my numbers, each one of those three has just vaulted the business and profitability to the next level. Yeah. You said it just right now, the profit profitability as well, because I see that most of the entrepreneurs as well, they think about sales, let's say revenue. They totally forget about um, net profit or profit. Like they, they literally, they, as you said it, they don't know the numbers coming from a finance background again and again. This is my, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, this is my weakness point. I just don't understand how can people start, you know, or think that they have already a business and they really don't have either a good accountant. If they don't have a good background in finance, they need to have someone who would lead them and guide them and help them in understanding, as you said, the metrics, the KPIs, where, where, is, where are we now and where are we heading? And this is really, really important. And um, honestly, I, I love this because also you said it a, a very important factor, not just about sales and not just about knowing your numbers, but also your employees and your relationships, uh, which is also sometimes it can be a killer or a big headache if you don't know how to deal with people. There's something, there's a topic that, that you love to talk about, which is um, how to lead like a lion, but manage like a squirrel. And it really grabbed my attention because mm -hmm. it's very interesting. The, the paradox in here is just weird. Like what does it mean? And, and how can I be that lion at the same time manage like a squirrel? Sure. I, I found that, um, you know, as a business starts to grow, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs don't appreciate that they've now become the voice for people, for their team, they become the voice and the, the leader for their customers. That, that a lot of times as entrepreneurs, we create this little ecosystem of our, our team and our staff, our customers, even contacts, our vendors, our suppliers. So there's this whole little community that you've now got and built. And that oftentimes they're looking for you to tell them, and certainly in a time like now, to give them the update on how the business is doing, where we're going from here, what's going to happen next. Um, it's okay, we've got this. They're looking for that voice of leadership. And so I say to people, you have to be more of a lion in that big roar, that mm. voice for them. That's something that they can really follow, knowing that if we're all riding on the ship together, that somebody has the big wheel and is steering us on the horizon. And so the, the lead like a lion is really about demonstrating some leadership. And it doesn't mean yeah. making a big speech with fireworks and everything, but just consistently standing in front of the group or emailing out or doing a little video, but letting people know like, hey, this is what's going on. I, I talked to a great guy where he got took to Facebook and every three days started posting a video to all of his staff who were in quarantine, mm. to his customers and pointed everybody back and said, every three days I'm committed to giving you an update. And sometimes it was a message of encouragement. That is a great example of lead like a mm. lion. And the flip side of manage like a squirrel much like we can picture a squirrel sort of socking nuts away, that there's good management there. I always think of a squirrel as being the, the animal that's counting the nuts for the winter and tracking what have they got and how many more do the I need wise. to get. And the why, yeah. And that 
I could count on that squirrel to be able to give me a report on, well, how many do we have and how many more do we need and where have you got them stashed and how does that, and just they again coming back to that knowing the numbers, allow us to know the state of the business, uh, what else do we need to do today? They really allow us to make decisions with all the data, all that collection that they're doing. So that's sort of the two paradoxical personalities that I think every entrepreneur needs to have. Yeah, yeah. It's really, really interesting. I love it. I love how, like, seriously, if you want to think about it uh, in that way, it's true. Uh, People need leaders like that to make them feel that they're safe, that someone is taking care of them. He's the captain of the ship. He's guiding them towards success. But at the same time, um, inside you're you're managing your your you understand what is happening and in control i love that um you said something about waking up every morning and thinking about how can i help someone new today which is sell 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 or which is i really really liked help 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 and it makes the idea of selling less um scary or it gives it a, a, a nicer meaning because most of entrepreneurs or most of people, they don't like selling. Uh, they feel that, so, and especially during this uh, challenging times, a lot of people were scared to sell. They don't know if they should be selling right now, if they should reduce their prices or giving their services for free uh, because they feel that it's maybe not ethical to get money from people despite the fact that you said it, you're helping instead of just imposing something that they don't need. Um, how do you, how do you, Marty, how do you pick your customers? How do you know, who do you want to help? Can you help everybody? Or do you have a, spe- a specific way and criteria of picking your customers? Well, first off, yeah, I wanted to touch on that idea of selling. You're right. So many entrepreneurs, uh, Well, so much of every society thinks that selling is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But I think as soon as you really believe in your product or service, the ability to say, I'm coming from a good heart place and I'm offering this service or product because I really do believe it can help someone. It makes it way easier to approach people and you can be enthusiastic. And then all of a sudden, ironically, you come across as less of a salesperson. You're not that kind of greasy used car salesman that everybody might think of. And I think that when you come from a good heart place, it's so much easier to talk about your product. I think enthusiasm is sometimes the best thing that sells is just to be able to get out and tell your message, tell your story, and people will respond, hey, I think I need that. Maybe I should talk to you more. So sometimes it's less about what people think of, I think, as traditional selling and just maybe shouting your message from the rooftops. And I think when you get into who, do you, who can you help in business, you know, for me, the audience is often entrepreneurs. But I think, as you and I have maybe touched on, that for us, there's a lot of resources for the startup entrepreneur. I had to look and say, if there was really one kind of entrepreneur, where, is, where do I think there's the biggest need? Who are the people that I'm passionate about? And I think it's mm-hmm. those people who are going through, have gotten through the startup phase and thought that was going to be the toughest part. And then they get to having a, maybe a physical store or office. They've got a team they have marketing going, they've got all these moving pieces, they've got customers and deliveries to make. And they realize, oh my God, this is even worse than when I was a startup. And that for me is like, that's the place of, if you can master that and get through that piece. So I would say those are sort of, they're past startup, they're like the established entrepreneur. They're where everybody thinks, oh look, you've made it. And in fact, for most of us in that space, we don't feel like we've made it at all. We're like, it just got more complicated. I still need the help. And I think that that is a lot of entrepreneurs. I would say, if you feel like you're in a state of chaos, you're in the exact space you're supposed to be. Um, But that's, for me, is that established entrepreneur who wants to now try and grow and scale their business and figure out the best way to do it besides just running themselves ragged or, you know, being, making sure the business, coming back to this idea that the business needs to serve them again. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that's part of, you touched on profit. And if I can just go off on a bit of a tangent, I think we get into a business, we are so worried about serving our customers and then we want to serve our team and our staff and make sure they're okay. And at some point for profit, we need to make sure the business is serving us as the owner and entrepreneur Mm. too. Because you pay out everything, 
you pay all the bills, everybody's paid. And at the end of the year, it's like, okay, what's left in profit to pay me? And I like the idea that if you've waited that long, you're waiting too long to make sure the business is serving you. You've got to be one of those people that uh, gets paid in, in time and money and reward so that, because without you, the business won't continue. So we have to make sure that the entrepreneurs rewarding themselves along the way too. Exactly. Exactly. And, um, you were talking about your book, which is, it's called, guys, Tiger by the Tail, 99 Secrets to Tame and Master Your Business. So people can find it on Amazon, right? That's right. Yeah, Amazon or Audible. It's awesome because I was just talking to Marty before the show and I was telling him how much I really felt that I really needed to have that book. I have to ship it or to download it as soon as possible because um, as we said, or as you said, People think that just the starting phase is the most difficult one. Sometimes you might transition from being a corporate guy, leaving your job and starting something new with all the complications and the fear and the, the anxiety that comes with building a startup. But at the same time, people think that, oh, you made it. And then you find yourself alone again. You need more guidance and more help in a lot of things. And the other day I was talking to a friend He's an investment, um, he's a financial investment uh, advisor. And we were talking about how to build an exit plan and how people sometimes they even ignore the concept of having an, an exit business plan and exit plan in place. And because most of people also, they're too attached to their business and to their idea that they cannot give up sometimes on the control. Sometimes you have to understand that Maybe now at this stage of growth, maybe you have to give up even leading or controlling your business and give it to someone who's maybe more, um, let's say, uh, more um, uh, experienced in this, uh, who can take, take it to grow and scale even more. Uh, can you tell us, okay, it's 99 secrets I know in your books, but can you give me, at least me personally, one or two things that you consider are crucial for established uh, entrepreneurs or business owners um, the same way that you have in your book? What are the, what are one or two things that you can help us uh, with? Um, so some of the, so through the 99 secrets and the way that came about was I was uh, started talking to clients and clients would say, well, how do you know that? How come my banker hasn't mm. told me that? Or how come my accountant or, uh, and I realized, oh, that was a good idea. I should write that down. And I started making post-it mm -hmm. notes. And pretty soon I got enough post-it notes. I was like, I should start to write these all. And so I started documenting yeah. ideas that clients found very helpful. Um, so, and the book ranges, it's sort of, I think there's nine segments or 10 segments. And so one of it's around sales and marketing and sort of the typical areas you might think of. I think one of the things that's important to me is on the selling side is to get everybody in the organization selling. You know, from my receptionist, everybody has a different network of, of friends and families, and they're just in different places. And I think everybody has the ability to promote or brag about the company they work for, mm -hmm. and that builds reputation. So I love the idea that everybody in the organization should be a representative of the business and sell. Um, I'm a big fan of culture and how you actually put that in place. There's lots of companies that say, oh, this is our culture, and they talk about it but most people don't know how to actually implement it. And so getting down to, uh, okay, here's our culture. This is what it's about. How do you enact that? How do you represent it? So if you say, well, our, one of our fam family is a culture word for us. It's like, well, how do you treat people like family? What do you do? Is it a matter of everybody hugs? Is it a matter of once a week you break bread together? Is it, what do you do that represents family? And so knowing how to take a culture and really make it an active thing is so good for a business because people want to be part of a group or part of that culture. Um, I think I talk a little bit about, you know, partnerships and how to manage that relationship. One of my favorite chapters is called drink scotch. Now you don't actually have to drink scotch, but the principle behind it is just finding a way to have good, honest conversations to keep your partnership healthy. Yeah. Um, I think the last section I talk about is, uh, and I think people like this is you need an entourage. So I talk about the business owner management, managing yourself. And I think too often business owners, again, are giving and are kind of run ragged. And I'm like, you need an, an entourage of maybe it's a chiropractor, a massage therapist, somebody who does your hair, a personal stylist, 
a partner at the gym, but people who help you stay healthy, help you stay happy, um, routine that goes along with that. So much like a rock star getting off a private plane with their whole entourage of people, mm -hmm. a good business owner maybe doesn't have a full-time chef, but maybe they have a food service that sometimes helps them cook or they you know, have mm -hmm. a favorite restaurant they work with. So it can be less than you know, a full-on entourage, but that they've got a support network and system of people that are helping them be better because there's so much demand on us as entrepreneurs to be good for all of that little ecosystem, our clients, our suppliers, our staff. So you got to have people that support you. And I think those are a few things, um, you know, three or four that come out of the book. But I really do find that at different times, every one of those 99, is I, 99 ideas applies to every business owner around the world. Mm. So basically, they're not just, let's say, uh, inspiring uh, secrets or notes they are like really practical things that we can take and implement uh immediately and, and, I, and i love that yeah. because i think we are just tired of telling tired of theories tired of yes. ideas we need something from the real life something that would help us really take implement and just have uh, because we're all busy we all like life is not maybe like before because I sometimes I hear my dad he says like oh it was like we had all the time and but now it's extremely busy and I don't know how we just lose time and 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 the the, the sense of the day so we need something or we need the help to absorb and to implement fast and there are a lot of people out there uh you know let's say claiming that they're having a business or expertise in this and that but what i loved about marty and the idea of the book is that since the age of 21 i'm sure that you passed through all the mistakes in the world <laughs> for a person to like try and 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 fix and um for people who are starting at this let's say at a late later age um sometimes uh, being scared and having imposter syndrome and just being just scared of selling are, are really a big issue. So coming to later on to real issues of real business is something like totally, totally different. And I recommend everyone to go grab a copy of that book. Um, if you are really serious about growing your business, uh, uh, planning to be in control and know uh, how to avoid, let's say, mistakes um, that we really uh, don't need to, to um, have. So um, I just wanted to, ha to ask you one last question. You said you, you sure. like to talk about um, how you can, how it's okay to fire clients, which yes. is, again, it's really weird because people, they like to pile more clients. We hold on to clients. We talk more about retention and how to make loyalty plans and, and keep our clients in. But to fire a client is like different. So how is that possible? Well, I know it sounds counterintuitive because you're right. We're always trying to get more clients. Why would you ever let, want to let some go? But I think what happens is the business progresses and sometimes clients don't progress with it. So you get a very early on client and because you, you know, in the early stages, you'll take anybody on. You don't charge enough money. Um, you say, here, I'll deliver the product and you include extra services or you say, you can call me anytime. And yeah. you pick a client where now they become sort of high maintenance, right? They're, they're sometimes difficult. They don't pay on time. They don't pay as much as the newer clients. And so your prices tend to start to go up. You refine your services. And oftentimes old clients are people that you say, well, if I had the chance to take them on as a client today, I probably wouldn't. But out of loyalty, we say, but I can't, I can't get rid of those people. But when you get some of those clients you identify as bad, you have to be able to let them go in order to make room for more clients who are going to progress into the, with the business into the future. And so there's a natural progression where not all clients are lifetime. Some of them have a season or a period, and particularly through the early years in a business, um, you keep adjusting what you offer and how you offer it, and you can't be uh, shackled or handcuffed by a client who's like, well, four years ago, you used to do it this way. 
Well, that's true. Mm-hmm. But over the course of four years, I've learned what I need to do different in my business to make it work. And they usually have expectations that are really, really old. And again, oftentimes they're not great clients because maybe in the early mm-hmm. days, you didn't really have a lot of rules. And now you know how you want clients to operate and, and there's rules in the business now. And they don't want to play by any of those rules because they like the old mm-hmm. days when we first started, there was none. And the prices yeah. were lower. And so I like to just say, you know what? This has been a great relationship and I want to invite you to go do some, do some work with somebody else now. And yeah. uh, oftentimes it is so great because when you often, I mean, I've found this to be true where with staff, I sat with them and said, who would we like to fire? Which client do we not like at all? And the staff know instantly. They're like, oh, I know who it is. You know, it's Joe at such and such company XYZ. And you say, okay, well, now in order, I always like the process. In order, I would say to my team, in order for us to get rid of Joe, because we recognize he's a tough customer or doesn't pay on time, we have to replace him. So we're going to got to go get a client now to Mm. replace Joe. So I think there's Mm. a healthy turnover there or um, transition. It's not just... I wouldn't advise listeners to just go fire all fire. their bad clients today. <laughs> right. That's not the don't, best. Don't. We still need the cash flow. But to systematically say, okay, if we bring on two more, let's get rid of the two that we are struggling mm. with. Um, so it's just, and it's also having the freedom or feeling powerful enough in your business to say, wait, it's not just about customer service all the time. The business has to serve my team and me. And that's a different mindset for a lot of entrepreneurs to move into, to be successful long term. I really, really like this idea because, for example, for me and my husband, when we started our company, the property management software, and even now, we always try to think uh, um, very well about the clients that we approach from the beginning. Like the minute we feel that they're not the type of people that we would love to work with, the people that we feel that uh, we cannot build a very long term relationship with them um we first of all we don't get sad or uh, we don't feel bad if it doesn't happen if the deal does not happen and uh sometimes we pray that uh, we hope that he doesn't (laughs) he doesn't say yes we don't want to work (laughs) with them right (laughs) oh my god so um so when you say that you come and you tell your team who are we going to fire today is this like a um a continuous audit? Do you do this weekly, monthly? Like when do you come up and decide that, come on, let's fire someone today? I would say it's, yeah, maybe monthly or quarterly. Really? So it's sort of a discussion in the back of the mind, but certainly not weekly. I don't want to encourage clients. I don't want my team thinking that all we're ever focused on is who are we going to get rid of. So I'd say the focus mostly is about what are we doing to foster relationship with our clients? What are we doing to add value? What are we doing strategically to help them mm. in their thinking? But then once in a while to change it up and say, who are we not enjoying? Who is a difficult client? Who is, doesn't fit our model anymore? So yeah. that even my team realizes like there's some criteria exactly. or there's some evaluation that needs to go on all the time with our clients. And so there's behind that, those conversations, there's a little bit of process or thinking mm. that uh, is there. It's not just random. Now, occasionally you do take on a client, like you said, where... You say, oh, from the day they said yes, I knew we should have said I knew it. (laughs) Right. And so, yeah. Uh, But I I think that uh, you, and you mentioned it, there's the mindset of business owners. And I I have a bunch of, I would start my book actually with a whole section on mindset because I think Mm. the mindset, your mind is where the whole business is being developed long before it happens in the physical. And I think that from feeling like I'm not a salesperson to I'm an imposter to, oh, I could never fire a client to we're having all these mental conversations first before we, you know, go into our business every morning. And so I think that developing some awareness, sometimes having an outside coach or somebody who can hear how you're play back to you, this is how you're thinking. Uh, But Mm -hmm. I think getting an awareness of your mindset and how it might be influencing the performance in your business is really, really important. I think there's yeah. very successful entrepreneurs who still a lot of mornings feel like imposters. Or yeah. I know lots of, I, I've been with one of them. I've been one of them where I thought, this feels like a house of cards. From the outside, it looks so good. But I'm, if people knew, I'm sure at any point this could fall apart. Now that may be mm-hmm. not true, but that's, you start to tell those funny stories and you're always battling yes. with that little voice in your mind. 
Yeah. Oh my God. I know that it happens every day for me. Seriously. And sometimes I feel like yes. I'm so lucky that my husband is there so that we can support each other. If I feel low today, then he's, he's in control. So I don't have to, right. I don't have to keep thinking about it all by myself. It's really, it's, it's real. Uh, fear is real. Imposter syndrome is real. And uh, this is business, but this is, that's why sometimes you feel that it feels even greater when you do something really good and you see the, the, the achievements that you've done, um, you forget all about the fear and, and everything else. So um, that's right. If you can tell the audience one thing that would help them, I know you said so many uh, valuable things to, to, to help entrepreneurs, you know, um, succeed faster or even avoid things or mistakes. But if you can tell them, and help them from your experience with one thing that would really, like if, if they can take it today to implement and they will feel a difference um, uh, or to avoid if there is a mistake that they can avoid, what is the one thing that you can advise them with? I got a great piece of advice from a really successful entrepreneur a few years ago and it really impacted me. And that was, he said, don't be afraid to dream big. And he said, dream you know, really big if you want to. Because he said, in my experience, I first wanted to set a $10 million company. And he said, then we just, after we set that goal, it was all logistics. We could work back everything to figure out how to do it. And then we became 10 million. And he said, then we thought, geez, what if we could go to 25? And he said, as mm -hmm. soon as we set 25 and the number of customers we were going to have, then it was all logistics in terms of figuring out how to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And so now he runs almost a half a billion dollar organization. And every, every turn, he said, we probably should have started dreaming bigger and thinking bigger right out of the gate. Because once we sent that goal, it was all logistics. And so I think I would encourage everybody to be empowered in setting that next goal, whether it's revenue or size of customers or geography you're in, but really follow your heart in terms of how big you want to play. And then know that everything, once you've made that real commitment, is just logistics. It is small decisions to figure out how do I get there. And that for me is a huge oh. takeaway and great learning for any entrepreneur. I love it. I love it because I totally believe in it. Uh, I always say this. I'm a girl from Jordan, which is a very, very, very tiny, small country in the Middle East, uh, working now in Saudi Arabia. But I always had this in my head i don't know why seriously i don't know how but i always believed in dreaming big and never um focusing on let's say what we miss in this life what we don't have but just focus on what you can get and what you can do and how you can grow and where you can reach so yes dream big i love it marty you you were awesome i i'm so happy that we had this conversation today Me too. um seriously thank you so much if people want to know more about you and about your services and your book where can they find you sure so uh they can find me just at my i've got a website uh it's www.martypark.com it's just m-a-r-t-y p-a-r-k.com or uh they can find out the book uh, at Amazon or Audible, but it's uh, where you can go by, go to the website, which is tigerbythetailbook.com. And, uh, and you can find me on social media at The Marty Park on Instagram and Twitter and all the rest. Awesome. Thank you so much. It was amazing having you today. Thank you. Thank for you being very here. much. I love this. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you liked today's episode, would you please take a minute to rate and review my show? That would mean the world to me. And let me know if you have any questions in mind or something that you're struggling with so I can cover in future episodes. And don't forget to subscribe so you won't miss out. Let's accelerate your success together. And remember, success is not an accident. Success is a choice. See you next time.